Well, hey everyone, what is up? Welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Austin, this is Gospel Simplicity, and I am so glad that you're here today. Today, I have a really exciting interview for you with Dr. David Bradshaw, a professor of philosophy at the University of Kentucky. And we're gonna be talking about the essence energies distinction in orthodoxy, but also just in scripture and how this plays out and to a whole host of doctrines. He is so articulate on this topic and man, I had a great time. I think you're really going to enjoy it. While you're getting ready for it and before we go, I would just want to say a couple thank yous. First of all, I want to say thank you to my patron subscribers and merch buyers who make this channel possible. Thank you so much, especially to my patrons who give monthly to help support this channel. Because of them, not only is this channel able to continue to be sustainable, but allows it to grow into exciting and new things. And also because of them, these videos don't have mid-roll ads anymore, so we can thank them for that. So anyway, if you're interested in becoming a patron and supporting this channel, you can do so using the link down below. It would mean a ton to me. Also, I want to say thank you to our sponsor today, Kindred. Kindred is a Christian company that exists to help people reclaim sacred time with God. And they do that through making these beautiful Bibles that will help you engage with scripture in new and profound ways. They're filled with full page images and it will encourage you to read more slowly and contemplatively. I've loved them. They're a great company and you should definitely check them out. You can do so by going to kindredapostle.com. And hey, if you want to get one, you can use the promo code gospel10 to get 10% off your order today. Well, with all that being said, I will let us get to the interview. I hope you enjoy it. Dr. David Bradshaw earned a Bachelor's of Science in Physics from Auburn University and has a PhD in Philosophy from the University of Texas. His research focuses on the ways that ancient Greek philosophy shaped medieval philosophy and religious thought and how these in turn contributed to the formation of modernity. Most of his work to date has been on the philosophical roots on the division between the Greek-speaking Eastern and Latin-speaking Western branches of Christianity. He's also the author and editor of several books, including Aristotle East and West and a recent textbook, Medieval Philosophy. Dr. David Bradshaw, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I am really excited to have you here. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about this thing called the essence energies distinction. But before we jump straight into that, I'd love to know just a bit of your background outside of what we had in the bio there. How did you end up as a professor of philosophy? Well, let's see. I, I, I'd say my love for philosophy began reading C.S. Lewis back when I was a teenager. Um, this is, what, 40 years or so years ago. And... Um, so I took a lot of philosophy in college, even though I was a physics major. And I, my initial interest was actually philosophy of science. And I went to Notre Dame. They had a program in history and philosophy of science. I went in, into that as, my, as a graduate program right out of undergrad in 1982. And, but when I got into the program, I realized, well, you, it's not that easy just to jump from science into philosophy without proper preparation. So I realized I needed to get a lot more, you know, read a lot more in depth in um, the, the classics of philosophy, beginning with Plato and Aristotle. So I actually dropped out and uh, worked for eight years, uh, mostly using the physics degree. I worked in uh, infrared research. And all that time I was reading philosophy uh, at night, you know, on my own and trying to get ready to go back to grad school. And so it's it's been a lifelong love, but um, you know, philosophy is great because you don't you don't necessarily have to be an academic to do philosophy, and I, I experienced that, and I'm very glad I did. You know, I think it's it's uh, if you are a professor, it's really helpful to have worked in the world, uh, so called, that other people do at work all you know their whole lives, and you have to understand that's where the great majority of your students will be, and you have to have some uh, kind of connection with you know with what their lives are going to be. So it was helpful also in that way. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing some of that. And so you mentioned C.S. Lewis, that he was an uh, influence in your early life. Did you grow up as a Protestant? Or I know C.S. Lewis has a very uh, wide audience. So just out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I was a Protestant. Uh, my parents uh, are Methodist and um, my father being in the Air Force. So I attend mostly the Protestant chapel services. And, um, you know, so I, was, I was sort of a non-denominational Christian in college, and uh, most of what I knew and believed came really from reading Lewis, and um, I also, you know, liked the other Inklings, uh, 
And then I was even active in Campus Crusade for a little while. You know, I was I was sort of part of that whole um, evangelical movement that was strong back, especially I think in the late 70s, uh, early 80s on campus, university campuses. So um, yeah, but I, I converted to orthodoxy when I was in college. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, I'm sure there's a lot to get into there, uh, but we'll leave that perhaps mm -hmm. for another day on how that happened. Um, but I'm, I'm sure this is true for you then as well, that for me as an evangelical, I didn't grow up in church hearing about this idea of the essence energies distinction. It just wasn't vocabulary that was uh, in my repertoire of things. So for those that are perhaps uh, grow, grew up in a tradition like myself or in a tradition like yourself, could you uh, just give us some background on what does this even mean, this idea of essence energies? Could, could we maybe define terms here? Yeah. Well, uh, it's something that in a way we're all very familiar with if you read the New Testament. The word energy uh, in English derives from the Greek word energia, and that's a word that Saint Paul, <coughs> excuse me, that Saint Paul uses about two dozen times. Uh, energia, as well as the the verbs that are cognate to it, uh, energain, the active voice, and energesthai, the passive voice. Um, they're quite prominent, actually, and it's especially striking if you sort of do a word study in that word group in the New Testament you find that St. Paul uses them uh, pretty often, hardly anyone else does. Uh, I think there's maybe one occurrence in the, in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, but otherwise, it's sort of a term that he picked up and, and you might say made his own and made distinctive as, of his own theology. And uh, early Christian readers recognize that because then when you go to the Apostolic Fathers right after the New Testament, they're using it in the same way that St. Paul did. Um, and so do the Greek apologists in the second century. So it becomes a kind of term of art uh, in Christian theology quite early. And, you know, so anyone who's interested in basic Christianity, the New Testament, really should know about this. Uh, the reason we people typically don't is because it's not translated, of course, as energy in English versions of the New Testament. And there's a whole story about that. Um, uh, the long, the short version is that our English translations are, are sort of in the wake of, in the tradition of, uh, the the Vulgate and the other Latin translations, including the Old Latin that were that were used in the West, uh, in the Middle Ages, and when you try to translate this word group energia and energain, and energesthai into Latin, you hit a, uh, a couple of problems. The nearest noun you can find to energia is operatio, okay, Oper which operation, working, uh, perhaps activity. But um, the verb operatio is a deponent, and so it, there's no distinction of active and passive voices. And what happens as that verb is used to translate the two verbs, energain and energesthai in Greek, a lot of St. Paul's meaning sort of gets washed away. and the idea of energy, which I think is there in the Greek, um, sort of disappears. And what, what, what's left is the idea of operation or working. And that's the way it's normally translated in English New Testaments. Um, and so part of what, what gets lost then it, that's, that you see if you're reading this in Greek with attention to the to sort of the nuances of this word is the whole concept of synergy is really, really important in St. Paul. And it just doesn't come through, not as strongly, not as clearly in uh, the Latin translations or the English translations. And of course, this was not something that anyone ever um, intended. Uh, no one translating the New Testament set out to <laughs> sort of distort what's going on. It's just a, a natural occurrence when you try to render one language into another. And I think the whole process was exacerbated because, of course, in the late 4th, early 5th century, people in the West really were no longer reading Greek. I mean, you find that even with Augustine. He talks about this in the Confessions, how um, they tried to teach him Greek as a child and he wasn't interested. And um, he was, you know, a highly educated man. So um, what happened was in the West, in the Middle Ages, the Latin New Testament sort of was the, was the New Testament. And Western theology came to be sort of 
grow up on that basis. And I think this Pauline idea of synergy really didn't become central in the way uh, for the West that it did for the East. And um, uh, that has a lot of implications. So uh, anyway, that's, I haven't really answered your question about essence and energies. Okay, the word essence, usia in Greek, that's not in the New Testament, at least not in with that meaning of it. That's a term that comes up sort of, you might say, through conciliar theology, particularly the Nicene Creed, homo usion, of one essence with the Father. Um, so it becomes part of Christian theology as well. And once it does, beginning in, in the fourth century and later, then you find people contrasting the divine essence or usia with the divine energy, energia. And, um, you know, we can talk about this as we get into it, but roughly the contrast, the essence being what God is in himself, uh, uh, how he knows himself to be independently of his relation to creation, you might say his eternal being, and the energy being uh, God as he is manifest and active, including uh, among creatures. And that, again, that's the meaning that it has in the New Testament. Um, and so um, uh, that contrast, essence and energy, then, becomes for Greek, the Greek patristic tradition, you know, those who are reading the New Testament in the original Greek, uh, it becomes a central idea. And it just really never even appears in the West. It's not that people rejected it. They just didn't know about it. Um, so I think it's a, it's a great treasure, treasure uh, waiting to be rediscovered, really, by, uh, by you know, the, the mainstream of Western Christianity. Well, that was really helpful. Thank you. And that's fascinating to me how language ends up shaping theology. And I've heard people hypothesize about what would have happened if Augustine would have paid a little more attention in his Greek classes growing up. And of course, we can't know. But the way that that has shaped the divide, which I know is something that you know a great deal about. It's also interesting for me to hear, as someone growing up in the West and as a theology student here in the West, it uh, the term essence feels a little more... Uh, normal to me. It, it's something, we might not have like said it a lot growing up in church, but as you get into theology, like, okay, that's the word you hear. But energies isn't something that we talk about in the West, yet that's the word that we find in scripture versus that usia word. And so you mentioned that you think there's kind of a great uh, treasure trove of, of insights here for the, the West to reclaim if they can really just dig into this and this great patristic tradition that mainly grew up in the East after the uh, separation of languages between the East and the West. And I imagine there might be people that are out there and they're saying, oh, okay, that, that, that sounds true. I mean, this sounds interesting, but what are those consequences of accepting this or... Rather, what are, there, what are they lacking in not growing up with this or having never heard of this? Are there legitimate theological consequences to this? Or I, I can imagine people sitting back and saying, man, this seems like just something for the theologians and their ivory towers. So what is the consequence of this doctrine? Well, again, I think uh, the single one that's most important, there are several, but the most important is synergy. Um, you know, it makes a huge difference to your life as a Christian if you think of what you're doing, you know, your, your every breath, you might say, as something that you're doing in cooperation with God. God is enabling you. God is working through you. God is um, strengthening you. And, and um, you know, you're never just a passive vessel. You're a co-worker. But as a co-worker, you're not uh, shall we say, sort of, you know, it's like two men working, not like two men working together build, to build a house who are equal and so forth. It's rather that God imparts to you the energy to do his will. And as you do his will, your acts become his acts. All right. Um, you know, and of course, this is runs through the New Testament. Um, let me just you know, remind you, I'm sure you're, you're well familiar, but for instance, in 1 Corinthians 3, uh, you have St. Paul saying, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase, for we are laborers together, which is synergoi, with God. You are God's husbandry, you are God's building. So we're God's co-workers, his synergoi, and the question is, what does that mean? You know, I think it's, um, 
natural if you haven't really thought very carefully or read you know uh, much of the the larger teaching that's behind this just to think in those terms of two men working together to, to build a house and i'm cooperating with god but god is something external to me uh well that's not what saint paul is talking about at all uh you know so another passage that again i'm sure is very familiar philippians 2 12 to 13 um and i think this is the king james which i always love the king james wherefore my beloved as you have always obeyed not as in my presence only but now much more in my absence work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is god which worketh in you and worketh there is the verb energain that i mentioned a minute ago um, both to will and to do and again to do is energain both to will and to do of his good pleasure and the interesting thing in that passage is you can ask the question well who's doing the willing and the doing at the end is it uh god or is it the philippians and it's ambiguous both in greek and in english it says god works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure um, he shifts to the infinitive there to will and to do and of course the infinitive doesn't have a subject at least not one that's stated so you have to infer what's the subject and in the context i think it's equally both it's the philippians who are willing to doing uh, excuse me willing and doing and it's god and so their willing their doing becomes that of god and that's the pauline idea of synergy where what we do is um enabled and, and realized and made effective through the power of god working in us um, another example that uh, this one doesn't use the word energia but i think it's it's another one that kind of leaps to mind is uh saint paul you know when he describes his conversion on the road to damascus there's that episode where the lord says to him saul saul it is hard for you to kick against the pricks and the fact that he says that tells you that he has been trying to direct Saul, trying to influence him against this evil path that he's taken. And Saul has been resisting. He's been kicking against the pricks. And as Paul looks back on that, you know, and and he in, in all these passages where he's reflecting on his ministry, there are many of those, you can see that for him, this is the moment when not only, you know, is he enlightened and he comes to know who jesus really is but also he becomes you might say now he's really himself now he's no longer in that state of resisting god internally now he is open to receive that influence and grace and energy from god and it's made him more who he really is right it's made him able to be the person god intends him to be and uh so when i refer to synergy that's that's what i have in mind and i mean <laughs> the christian life is all about that and if we don't have that clear and have a way to articulate it as well as understanding the biblical basis for it um then we can just sort of drift and and have a really wrong idea of, of what we are as christians that, that's really interesting the way that you connect um this doctrine about God and that he has, you know, essence and energies, and there's a distinction here, and then how that plays out in us with kind of this idea of synergy, and I, I think that's really helpful, and I think it's helpful to be thinking theologically in such ways that we're able to make those connections. If you would, I can imagine there's people that are saying, okay, like the language he's using, it, it's different terms than I might use, but yeah, I, I would say for the most part, like, yeah, that there's this dynamic of this synergistic dynamic. Now, of course, we could get into it in some Protestant circles that might get you in some trouble, but could you maybe connect the dots as to why you see this as, um, why you see a doctrine of divine simplicity, um, there's something, and perhaps, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm definitely a, a bit out of my depth here, um, but in the East, we generally have this essence energies distinction, whereas the West has a more strong sense of uh, absolute divine simplicity. Why would this idea of synergy not work on that model or not work as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And this too is very important. 
um, it's, it's sort of a discussion that takes place uh, more at the academic level, academic theologians, philosophers in the Middle Ages. But, you know, those ideas filter down and they shape the way the church operates and uh, what the teaching is that's given to the people, how, the, how Christian belief, uh, even scripture is interpreted. So um, divine simplicity. All right, this is an ancient idea. You can find it already in Aristotle, uh, maybe even the pre-Socratics, if you want to go back that far, that, that God is simple. He has no parts. Um, he is immaterial. He's also at least essentially unchanging. Now, I mean, that's a, that's a tricky issue because if God is active in history, as Christians believe, then, um, and particularly if he becomes incarnate, uh, the Son of God becomes incarnate, then you know, God is at least viewed from a temporal standpoint. There are ways in which he, his activity, his manifestation definitely does change. But um, essentially, he doesn't. Okay, he's eternal. And he's not even changed in the act of creating the world. He already is fully and completely what he is. Um, that was, you know, the common belief even among pagans who believed in one God and uh, Christians as well, both East and West. And when you get into the church fathers, you find them you know, developing this idea, but they begin to articulate it philosophically in different ways. You really have, uh, and I talk about this in, in my book that you mentioned, Aristotle East and West. You have in, uh, one, in the Eastern fathers, like say St. Gregory of Nyssa is a good example of this. The idea that one of the ways in which God is simple is that He's not a good or wise or powerful by participating in some reality external to himself the way that we are. You know, they're thinking in a sort of platonic way where for a human being to be wise is to part participate in wisdom uh, and to be good is to participate in goodness. Now, they also think that wisdom that we participate in, the goodness we participate in, that's God. Okay, they're not Platonists in the sense of believing in, believing in sort of self-standing forms. They take over a lot of that Platonic language of participation and apply it to the relation between creatures and God. Um, and of course, what also follows from that is God does not participate. He is the very thing itself. God is goodness itself. God is wisdom itself. God is life itself, being itself. And that kind of dovetails, you know, with some scriptural passages like um, Exodus 3.14, I am he who is. Um, they took that to be indicating God is in some sense being itself. Um, I am the way, the truth, and the life. God is life itself. You know, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Um, God is also love, agape, you know, in, in 1 John. So all these perfections that God has, he has them in a different way than we do. There's not, you might say, uh, ontological composition in the case of God as there is for us. For us, we only have those perfect uh, perfections in virtue of our relation to something external to ourselves. And that's not true for God. Well, okay, so that's, that's an understanding of divine simplicity that was already there in, in the fourth century in the East people like Gregory of Nyssa. Uh, in the West, about that same time, a little later, uh, you have St. Augustine. Also, uh, for him, divine simplicity is, is crucially important. It's one of the central themes of his thought. Um, and he agrees with Gregory of Nyssa. I mean, he has that similar idea. I don't know if he's read Gregory per se, but he has the same idea. God is not what he, he doesn't have his attributes by participating in anything else. But he also adds to it, um, another way of articulating or sort of stating philosophically how God is simple, that God is identical with his attributes. Um, how should I say this? Uh, altogether, okay, when Gregory, for Gregory, yes, God is the good, God is wisdom, God is life. But those are ways that God manifests himself. Uh, Gregory uses the word energia or energies, uh, plural for those. And he says, when we name God with these various terms, we're actually naming energies of God, um, energies, activities. Uh, 
operations, however you want to put it, but ways that God is active and manifest that we recognize and, and name. Um, Augustine, since he doesn't have that term or concept, doesn't go that way. He just says, no, we're naming the divine essence. Um, God is his own essence, essentia, um, and that essence that is also the divine goodness, power, wisdom, life. And in fact, he then goes further uh, to add two other, or at least implicitly, one is explicit, um, that are really even more important, um, his, uh, his activity, oper operatio, okay, and his will, voluntas. Um, God is his own will. Now, that's where I think theologically you, you can see this is going to lead to some problems because if God is eternal and unchanging, doesn't that, that mean that the divine will has to be eternal and unchanging? Uh, well, yes, and actually Augustine does draw that very conclusion. Uh, he talks about this at several points in the Confessions. I think, um, if I remember, it's book 12, chapter 15, I think is maybe the, the most emphatic. Um, uh, eternal, unchanging, and furthermore, God, as I was saying, well, God is what he is independently of his relation to creatures. Okay, because uh, as I mentioned, he's already eternally full and, and fully realized um, even prior to creating. He doesn't need to create the world to be what he is. Well, if that's true of God, then on Augustine's view, it's also true of the divine will, which is just one of the names that we give to the divine essence. All right. Um, and the implication of that is that God's will is not only eternal and unchanging, it's also sort of fixed fully from his own side without uh, any re interaction or response to what creatures do. Okay. And this, I think, is something where you can, you can see the metaphysical roots behind Augustine's understanding of predestination in which God's election, and he says this, you know, explicitly and emphatically, is not uh, a response to what creatures will. It's something that God determines, and then he gives grace in accordance with that. And that grace enables some creatures to, to will good, and, and those who do not receive the grace, uh, they're not able to will good. And uh, the, the point, though, is that all the initiative is fully on God's side. So you see how synergy has disappeared from that picture. Um, it's really not synergy that he's describing. It's uh, monergy or mon mon energy, however you want to say that. That uh, It's just God's activity, God's will, God's determination that's behind everything. And that whole idea that we're active cooperators with God through our own free choice, um, I think, is what's lost. Uh, and yeah, that has huge huge theological ramifications. And, you know, if you know much about the history of theology in the West in the Middle Ages, you know that this, this is something they just wrestled with repeatedly because uh, it, it's just, it's such a bitter pill to swallow, frankly. You know, the idea that God just determines of his own initiative to whom he will give grace, to whom he will not give grace. Um, and um, I would think, uh, at least I would, I, I, would add, I mean, this may be more controversial, that that picture of God is partly why uh, so many in the West have turned away from Christianity itself, because that picture of God is really um, deeply alien and, uh, cult, you know, just, it's not a God you want to believe in. It's not a God, you know, you don't want the world to be like that. Um, and what does it say about yourself and your own hopes and so forth? Um, so, Anyway, that's another way in which uh, uh, the lack of the idea of synergy then in, you sort of gets carried over into philosophical theology, beliefs like predestination, uh, via this other I key idea of divine simplicity. And uh, there are more too, I mean, it, you can go on, but uh, you can see how everything's connected to everything else in theology. And once you start with a bad premise, it's just going to, to kind of multiply.
Well, that was really helpful, and I really en- enjoyed listening to that. So thank you so much. And I, I think it's very helpful for people to be able to trace how one idea impacts another in theology, because like you said, they are all interconnected, or at least they should be. We, we struggle when our, we have these cognitive dissonances. But I think, as you pointed out, in the history of the West, we do experience some of that, because we see despite the, the like laudatory praise of Augustine throughout time, that people struggle to fully take in the implications of his monergism. I mean, if you read it in, in Augustine, it's there and it's it's pretty strong, at least on my reading. And then in the Reformation, you certainly see Luther and Calvin pick that up and run with it. But despite the, the love for Augustine, it, it does seem difficult for people to live that out. And I, I would think that one of the reasons in kind of the more uh, conservative Protestant circles that I've grown up in, that you know, this idea of monergism becomes such a, an important thing is because it becomes this almost like this gatekeeper, like you have to affirm it and they double down on it because they realize it's really hard to affirm consistently. It's hard to live that out. And because of that, it becomes this thing, well, you, you have to or you're out. And even though I had seen so much of that, I never connected that to this doctrine of divine simplicity versus the essence energies distinction. So thank you very much for that. Well, um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, there are probably people listening who just, who think I'm teaching heresy here um, because yeah, it did become a marker of orthodoxy, sort of little low orthodoxy in the West. And it, that was true already in the middle ages. You know, people often associate this with Calvin, but it's really already there in Augustine. Uh, Calvin just sort of doubles down and makes some things more emphatic, but uh, the basic idea is there, and it and in my opinion, it's it's a necessary philosophical consequence of a certain way of understanding divine simplicity, and I think that that conditions the way that Augustine reads the biblical passages on predestination and election. Um, and you can see that if you compare what he says to the way that other church fathers read those same passages. Uh, you know, if you go back to Origen, now Origen, of course, is, has its own problems in a way, but book three, chapter one of On First Principles by Origen is the, the sort of the locus classicus in the East for the discussion of election and predestination. Uh, it was judged to be itself sufficiently orthodox that, you know, what the collection called the Philokalia that uh, Basil the Great and Gregory Nazianzen put together of selections from the works of Origen, uh, they included this chapter in the Philokalia. And that's why we have, actually for it, we have the Greek as well as the Latin translation by Rufinus, because it's in the Philokalia. Well, anyway, um, if anyone is interested in this issue, for an Eastern point of view, I would, I would encourage them to read that chapter, because Origen goes through all the biblical passages, Romans 9, Ephesians 1, uh, etc., and points out how you can take those um, in, in a way that you know leaves plenty of room and does full justice to human free will and to the reality of synergy. Okay, because as he sees it, you know, for instance, um, God hardening Pharaoh's heart. Um, well, he says that's sort of like the way the sun hardens mud. Okay, makes it clay, but the sun also melts wax, and it's the same sun that does both, and it's the same activity, the same presence of that sun. It's just it's within the thing itself how it's going to respond. Or, you know, now mud doesn't have free will, right? This is an analogy, but you could say the mud determines that it will be hardened, the wax determines that it will be melted. Um, so he uses that analogy, and he has others. I mean, it's a long discussion, but. Uh, just to try to sort of incorporate the idea of free will that clearly is in St. Paul in these teachings about synergy. And uh, I think when, when you try to read the predestination passages without that, um, then you get very much a wrong picture of what St. Paul is saying. So um, anyway, you can find that in Origen. And then another great source is St. John Chrysostom. Um, I mean, I've, I kind of first became aware of this when I read Augustine's homilies on Romans uh, at the same time I was reading Chrysostom's homilies on Romans and it just leapt out to me how Augustine really has a philosophical system and he's reading everything in Romans in light of this philosophical system 
And Chrysostom is not, he's following the text. And he's also reading it in the original Greek. Um, and so um, that too, I would encourage anyone who, who you know, isn't sort of on board with this, just read those two together, maybe especially on Romans 9 and the other key passages and make up your own mind. Um, I think, you know, one thing you see in Chrysostom, he is very alive to that Pauline idea of synergy. Um, another great passage, he has a commentary on that passage in Philippians 2, in his homilies on Philippians, that's very uh, interesting, you might say, philosophically, because he, he really zeroes in on this concept of energia and energain, and he envisions a little dialogue between the Philippians and St. Paul, where the Philippians are saying, well, what do you mean? So does God do everything? And we're just kind of passive recipients of, of what he does. And, and uh, he envisions then St. Paul answering back and saying, no, didn't you read what I said? That uh, it's God who's working in you to realize and make effective the good. And you have to respond to the good that he presents to you. Um, and that's why he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, because it's up to you to respond to the good that God puts before you. And that's not a one-time thing. That's at every moment of your life, everything you do. You're always in this sort of dialogical relationship with God. He's presenting the good to you. It's up to you to respond. Um, so um, I'm, I'm maybe getting off topic. But anyway, if, if people are sort of fixated on that monoenergistic idea that is so prevalent in Western theology, I encourage them, just read, start reading the Greek fathers who don't have an ax to grind. Um, they're, you know, they're long before this was anything like a controversy. They're just interpreting the text um, as they understood it as native speakers of Greek. And when you see what they say, I think um, you'll, you'll recognize that it's, it's actually right. Well, that's really helpful. And I think what an instructive um, opportunity for people to read Chrysostom uh, side by side with Augustine. And we live in a time when we're so lucky that it's so accessible to do that. They can do that for free online, albeit mm -hmm. in English. But that really does seem like a great opportunity if people are saying, hey, I'm just not sure about this, or I want to see what this looks like. That, that seems like a great way of doing it. And I loved the um, illustration you gave by Origen as well. That's a really insightful way of thinking about that. So thank you for that. And I think that Philippians verse is a beautiful illustration of this idea where we have these two things that depending on your approach, either seem contradictory. So this idea of, hey, work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it's God who's at work in you. And I think on some readings, that's just, it doesn't seem to work. But the reading you propose does seem to at least uh, offer a way of reading that, that seems to have some explanatory power. Now, I, I want to get into a little more of the history of this, and people might be saying a little more. It feels like we've done a lot, but mm -hmm. I think there, there's so much development here that's interesting. One thing I did want to clarify a bit is I think often this conversation, I brought this up earlier, is cast in the light of essence energies versus divine simplicity. But then you began your conversation on divine simplicity by citing Gregory of Nyssa and his understanding of what simplicity meant, which did have room for essence and energies. So would you say it's a bit of a mischaracterization to say it's any type of absolute, or sorry, any type of divine simplicity versus essence energies or hey, on one side, we have a particular view of divine simplicity that's perhaps more absolutist, and then essence energies over here. In other words, can someone, in at least some sense, accept the essence energies distinction while saying God is simple in a sense? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, everyone, uh, every Orthodox, you know, little o Orthodox Christian believes God is simple. Um, he's immaterial, he's eternal, he's unchanging. Um, has no parts, all that, you know, that's common ground. The question is then how do you sort of develop and articulate that idea philosophically? And that's where uh, you get different interpretations. Um, you know, one thing I argue in my book, I mean, this may get too much into sort of the weeds on philosophy perhaps, but, uh, you know, Augustine describes in the Confessions in Book 7 how for him the crucial point in his intellectual conversion to Christianity was reading what he calls the books of the Platonists. Uh, 
um, which probably was less Plato himself than it was Plotinus and Porphyry, who had been translated into Latin. And um, also in the City of God, Book 8, Chapter 6, there's a really interesting discussion where he describes what he thinks the Platonists got right about God. And if you read that, and if you know much about Plotinus, you'll see what he's really describing is um, what Pl in Plotinus is intellect. It's the second hypostasis. All right, in, in Plotinus, you have the one, that's the first hypostasis that's the source of all things. Intellect comes forth from the one through the process of emanation. It's not created. The one doesn't intend or consciously do anything, but just there's this process of emanation that gives rise to intellect. And then below intellect, intellect gives rise to soul. But intellect is simple. Um, in pretty much the way that Augustine identifies with the simplicity of God. And, you know, I talk about that in my book, but the just the basic point is that um, he's not getting his interpretation of divine simplicity just from scripture. You know, this is a philosophical reflection. Uh, it has to be. I mean, this is a, it's a philosophical concept. And um, he, I think, in my opinion, uh, at least, he sort of em, 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 absorbed what the Platonists had to say about intellect, the second hypostasis, he doesn't really absorb what they have to say about the one, the first hypostasis. And that's another way in which you can see some characteristic differences between Eastern and Western Christian theology. Um, that in the East, I think there's, in my opinion, again, a more balanced approach, because what what's lost when you sort of lose the the one the one that is beyond being okay you sort of if you don't incorporate that language as well you lose the sense of god beyond any human concept um god a mystery whom we can name through his activities through his energies through the way he manifests himself but his essence is always beyond beyond our knowing, okay? That's something you find in, like I said, Gregor of Nyssa, uh, St. Basil the Great, um, and others. You know, again, I, I reference all them in my book. Uh, so they have this sort of polar view in which there's God as he is manifest and known to us and that we can participate in, but there's also what's always beyond, okay? And in Augustine, uh, it seems to me that gets sort of flattened out. And there's not that polarity. There's simply God who is his own essence, who is his own wisdom and will and activity and so forth. And uh, that God, who is not now beyond being, okay, Augustine rarely, if ever, refers to God as beyond being in that sort of a way that the Eastern fathers do so often. Um, he's sort of more readily adaptable to a philosophical system, okay? It's the kind of thing that philosophers then sort of take over and run with. Uh, this idea of a God who is perfectly simple in the way Augustine described, et cetera, et cetera, that becomes really central to philosophical theology as it develops in the West. And, um, you know, if you know much about early modern philosophy, people like uh, Descartes and even Leibniz and Spinoza, they too, they're still working within that tradition and that way of thinking about God. And it, and frankly, it, it lends itself to uh, eventually being secularized uh, because you've got a philosophical concept of God as the supreme being that is that has all these nifty attributes like perfect simplicity and so on that you can philosophize about and you can build a whole philosophical system. Um, and it gets pretty far removed from the God of Scripture. You know, whereas if you keep the polarity in mind, you know, Scripture is full of divine mystery. Um, when God speaks to Moses from the burning bush and he says, I am he who is, that's not a philosophical proposition. That's, that's, that's warning Moses. You know, you've asked my name. <laughs> Here's my name. It's something that's beyond you. You can't, you don't know what that means. You can't, you can't uh, define and articulate and, and philosophize about this. This is beyond you. This is a holy mystery. This is why Moses has to remove his the sandals from his feet, right? And and the, the very burning bush itself is a symbol, a kind of a visible 
representation of God as this uh, presence from beyond. He, he, the bush burns, but it's not consumed, right? This ever-living fire that's manifest, but it has its own inner secret of being that, that we don't know and we can't know. Um, so anyway, that's very scriptural. Um, and scripture is not a philosophical system. So I think, uh, you know, this is sort of a big picture claim. I realize a lot of people might uh, take offense at this, but I, I, I think Western philosophy, Western Christianity became much too philosophical in the Middle Ages. Um, and we're still living with the effects of that today. Um, and if you read the Greek fathers, you find they just, they just don't do that. They have a different way of thinking. This has been fascinating. And the more we talk about this, the more I see that, you know, I think throughout this, you have done such a great job of answering this initial question of, is this just an issue for ivory tower theologians? Because the further we dig into this, the more I realize so many of the things that to me as uh, someone growing up in the West that seem very distinct about Eastern Christianity all in some way seem to touch back to this idea, whether it's that idea of synergism or even this idea of mystery as you bring it in now and the different approaches to philosophy, that they all come back to this. And I'm getting the sense that this is so much bigger than just a intramural debate between medieval theologians who wanted to quibble over whether you know, God was uh, absolutely simple or had some, you could meaningfully distinguish between essence and energies, that this, this isn't inconsequential. This touches a lot of things. And I've really enjoyed getting to hear so many of those. And the way you're able to draw in how history has shaped these things have been really helpful, as well as just, hey, not only is this, this isn't just a philosophical debate, but scripture, hey, like this seems to have great explanatory power for what we see in scripture. And so as we begin to wrap up here, I just kind of want to give you the floor. If there's anything we haven't covered that you want to say, hey, like this, this is really important because of this. If there's something you could have people know about uh, this essence energies distinction as, as they walk away from this that maybe you haven't been able to cover yet, I'd love to just give you a second to do that. Well, thanks. Yeah, there's at least one other theme from scripture that we haven't talked about yet that enters into this in an important way, uh, the divine glory. Okay, and of course that too is so prominent, both Old Testament and New Testament, um, culminating, I think, with the transfiguration of Christ, where, you know, he's seen enveloped in this radiant glory um, that clearly whatever it is, it's not just, it's not like the light you get when you turn, flip on the light switch, right? Um, there's something about that radiance that surrounds Christ at the transfiguration that is sort of the visible emblem representation or manifestation of his eternal divine being. Uh, and of course, in John 17, in the high priestly prayer, he, when he prays to the Father, he, he refers to the glory that I had with you before the world was and how he wants his disciples to share in that glory. Uh, well, this too is something that is so prominent in the Eastern Christian understanding that um, much less so in the West for whatever reason. I mean, uh, I think divine simplicity is part of in the background there um, because the way the West, or at least people like Augustine, you know, Augustine has a whole, in, in De Trinitate, book two, he has a discussion of the theophanies in scripture, the places where God ap appears, um, like the pillar of fire in the wilderness, like the divine glory at, at the tabernacle in the temple, or like the uh, tongues of flame at Pentecost, um, and the transfiguration, the light of the transfiguration. And, um, he says, well, these are creatures. They're not God because, you know, there's only two options. If it's God, it is the divine essence. Um, and so they have to be creatures. And he kind of speculates, are they angels that, that just took this certain form? Or was it just something distinct that God created for that moment and then it vanishes out of being? Um, but for the Eastern Fathers, these are manifestations of the eternal glory of God that he, through his, you know, condescension, he makes visible to us. And 
he sort of transforms the eyes of the disciples so that they're opened and they can see what's eternally always there. Christ always had, had his divine glory. Um, it's just that the eyes of the disciples were open to enable them to see it. So um, that becomes what in the East they refer to as the uncreated light. I mean, it's the idea of what it doesn't become, but, but that, they give that the name. They call it the uncreated light. And uh, later, in, during the Byzantine era, um, in Eastern monasticism particularly, uh, it's thought that prayer can be a way of sort of opening yourself up to that radiant divine presence. You find stories in like the early monks, the Desert Fathers, the fourth, fifth century, of when they pray, people see this light around them. And, you know, if you're Protestant, of course, I was a Protestant at one time. This sounds weird. This sounds like, oh, man, that's just wacky um, mysticism. Um, but you have to take seriously what is that divine glory? What is that light that radiates around Christ? And when he refers to the glory that he had with the Father from before the world was, that he wants to share with his disciples, what does he mean by that? Uh, so they took that very literally. And they thought that that's something, too, that we can experience in this life. Um, so I realize, again, this is sort of, you know, walking on the wild side a little bit if, if for the Protestant folks. But, I, you know, just to, to take it back to Scripture, uh, if you look at sort of the way theology developed in Western thought, the divine glory, that uncreated light of Christ, and they, they hardly talk about it. It's just not there within certainly the philosophical theology of, of the West. Uh, and it's so prominent in the East. That's something else that I think uh, we as, as Western Christians really need to try to recover. And the best way to do that is by looking at how it was understood within uh, the Greek Church Fathers. Well, that's wonderful. And I think people are going to have so much to walk away from this with to think about and, and to mull over to say, man, like there's some really good points here. And I imagine for a lot of my audience uh, that the largest section is Catholic, followed by Orthodox, then Protestant. And so I think both Catholics and Protestants are going to have a lot here to think about. And I think for a lot of people, you know, some of my more highbrow, theologically minded people might have thought about this before. But I think for a lot, this is just kind of like a almost a background hum to their theology, the idea of divine simplicity. It's not something that we're actively thinking about a lot. But then as you walk through this, they're able to see, oh, this does connect to different ideas I hold. And I wouldn't have even thought that these were, you know, a couple dominoes down from that. And so I think this is going to be great for people. And you've referenced it a couple times. I want times I'll let people know at the beginning. Uh, but as well, if people are interested in reading your book on Aristotle East and West, that will be in the description. I think they would love doing that. You've given some recommendations on where to go next, reading Origin, reading, well, I, I should maybe... Um, say the specific section of origin that you referenced. I know some of my Orthodox mm -hmm. viewers won't like me saying just go read origin uh, as a, a blanket statement. But uh, and also uh, the the challenge to read Augustine and Chrysostom side by side on Romans 9 and elsewhere, I think is a really good one if people want to go deeper here. But I would love to kind of give you the floor to say if someone is, has watched this and said, like, I want to dig in. I want to get my teeth into this. Is, is there anything else you would recommend for them? Uh, we, we've got your book, those different uh, church fathers, but is there a next step they should take? Well, um, so could I put in a plug again for that textbook of medieval philosophy? Um, it's called Medieval Philosophy, a Multicultural Reader. Okay, if I'm on the web here, I guess I can show the cover. And it's multicultural because it's the first textbook of this kind that uh, allows each of the great religious traditions to kind of speak for itself. So you have a section on Jewish philosophy, a section on Islamic philosophy, a section on Western Christian philosophy, and a section on Eastern Christian philosophy. And that last one uh, is the one that I edited. So it's essentially the Greek church fathers. It has selections from them that are some of their more philosophical teachings that are most of them relate to some of the things we've been talking about, like synergy, free will, essence energies, divine simplicity. Also, you see other aspects of it, you know, how that leads to the way they understand God's presence in the natural world, uh, that nature itself is a kind of theophany. Nature itself is 
if we could see it rightly, you know, if our eyes were open, we would see that it's radiant with the presence of God. And so, you know, all these ideas sort of develop gradually through time, and it has selections beginning with Justin Martyr in the second century and going through Gregory Palamas in the 14th century. And um, they're not too long, you know, so I tried to edit it in a way that would be readable for college students. Um, so that I, I would encourage people, again, there's just no substitute for getting to know the primary sources. Uh, I've also written a lot else besides my book. Uh, more recently than the book, I have a lot of articles and they're posted on uh, on the web, web on academia.edu. So uh, if you want to, you know, put that link up as well, people are welcome. I have an article, for instance, called uh, The Divine Glory and the Divine Energies that goes into more detail about how the Greek fathers interpreted the divine glory, if anyone's interested in that. So um, uh, those would be some places one could go. Well, I will be sure to link to all of that. I think people will be excited to dig into more of that. Dr. Bradshaw, it has been a pleasure having you on today. Thank you so much for your time. And thanks to everyone that watches this for your time. I know neither of us take that lightly. So thank you so much for being here. As always, I want to encourage you listeners that until next time, be on the lookout for more videos. And as always, go out and love God and love others, because truly, above all else, that will change the world.